Michael Schumacher's reign of dominance in Formula One came to a deflating end in 2005 as the latest rule change thrown in to destabilise Ferrari finally did the job. But for one race in 2005, ignoring that year's US GP of course, a Ferrari on Bridgestone tyres was the car to have. At times during this race, Michael Schumacher was lapping almost two seconds quicker than anyone else as he came through from 13th on the grid at Imola to hunt down Fernando Alonso through the final stint of a memorable San Marino Grand Prix. Alonso famously held his ground in a nail-biting finish, although if you watch this race in the UK, you missed two of the final three laps thanks to a poorly timed ad break that we'll explain in more detail later. Joining me, Glenn Freeman, for this look back into one of the most famous finishes to a race in F1's V10 era are Mark Hughes, who was in the ITV commentary box that day, and I'm delighted to welcome the man who was in the pit lane for ITV as well and still does that job today for Sky Sports, the one and only Ted Kravitz. Now, Ted, welcome to your first appearance on Bring Back V10s. It's great to have you along. We always start the show with the same opening question, so I'll throw that to you. When you think back to Imola 2005, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, now, Glenn, it's uh, those four words, poorly timed ad break. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's great. Let's, get, let's get in the poorly timed ad break, uh, first of all. Um, actually, when I look back on that weekend, um, I don't think about the, uh, the weather. It was, uh, it was a colder than usual sort of Imola uh, April weekend, I seem to remember. What I remember is the drive from the hotel where we stayed in a small spa town called Riolo Terme, I'm probably not pronouncing it well, to Imola. Um, we would drive in uh, and we'd enter Imola by the Rivazza gate and then have to sort of edge our way past the street that was full of crowds into the, into the one main exit uh, entrance at the sort of top of Rivazza 2, which is still the, the main entrance as far as I can tell. The only way you can get a car in uh, as we've been going back there recent times. But that drive from our hotel, which was the Pensione Alma, um, was one of the most epic drives on the Grand Prix calendar. And it just filled your heart with joy that I would always say at the airport, at Bologna Airport, it's okay, Louise, for Louise Goodman, who was my kind of car buddy, I'll drive, you know, and she'll say, oh, fine. You know. And uh, knowing that I would have the pleasure of doing that drive every morning. Um, it wasn't a fancy place, Mark. I don't know if you remember the Pensione Alma. I think yep. Richard Williams always used to, Richard Williams always used to stay there. I think you yeah, did. Yeah, I stayed there Tony, as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tony Dodgins, Alan yeah. Henry, I think. Um, you couldn't persuade Jim Rosenthal and Tony Jardine to stay there. They were, uh, they took one look at the place and, and, and headed straight for Bologna. <laughs> but um, it was it was basic, because it was basic, wasn't it? It but, was nice, uh, and you always got a nice welcome from the family who ran it. Exactly. Who I believe, actually, on doing the smallest bit of cursory research for this podcast, have just sold up oh. in the last few months. They've sold up. COVID has not been kind to the Pensione Alma, and they have sold up, and it is no more. It is it is permanently closed now, oh, what a shame. sadly. Um, it is a shame. But, uh, yeah, well, all I think about, Glenn, is that, uh, is that drive uh, through the vineyards um, or into into the Rivazza 2 entrance to the uh, to, to the paddock, where you always got the sort of lovely springtime feel to it. There was some blossom in the air. That old man's beard would sort of float down the paddock, the old paddock, and uh, it was just a joy to, to to be at. Yeah, that, um, that, that entrance is brilliant. I went there for the first time as a fan more than 20 years ago now, and I remember being baffled. We were on the streets, and the next thing I knew, I was stood outside Rivazza, and I, I couldn't believe... Obviously, you see the houses, don't you, overlooking the, the track down that area, and it's, it is just surrounded by by streets and parkland. It's, it's it's so nice around there. But Mark, what's what's your standout memory? How how was your drive into the circuit? Well, yeah, I was um, I was always just as enamoured of that place and of that of that road as as Ted. But um, I, I'll I'll talk about something else. Um, I caught up with Ross Braun on the Thursday, and. Um, you know, the, the, we'd had this f first two races of this previously all dominant team, and it was you know, just you know a shadow of its former self. It was a, it was not a contender. The, the as as you referred to the change in regulations for the tyres and um, banning of tyre changes had uh, really really um, put a, a spanner in its spoke. So, I, yeah, I just remember having a chat with Ross about you know how that was you know whether whether there were any solutions to hand and and what what he thought and i remember him saying well you know we've it's important to have a, a 
season like this sometimes because sometimes the the the, the people involved think it's always going to be like it has been for the last few years and really it, it gives you the um, stomach for the fight you've really got to have a stomach for the fight when you when you get a, into a situation like this and he, he said that he was looking forward to sort of um getting stuck in and um, digging his heels in although he was quite optimistic um, because the weather forecast uh, for the weekend as ted mentioned uh was very cool and uh, if if the bridgestones had any sort of um favored working conditions that year it was it was a cool track and it looked like that's what they were going to get so he, he was hopeful but also uh realistic yeah we'll get into that in a lot more detail we have uh, done an in-depth episode on Ferrari's 2005 back in our first series, so make sure you check that out as well. Before we get going, though, with Imola 2005, we'll give some quick shout-outs to those of you submitting your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. A thank you to Tommy Torrell, Tom Power, Stewie L. Griffin, and Ashbury710. And thank you to James Nicholson and Motorsport Pot for your recent votes in the Sports Podcast Awards. To cast your vote for free before voting closes in the next few days, head to sportspodcastawards.com and look for the motorsports category. This is also your last chance to get your questions in for our series finale episodes, where you can ask us anything about F1's V10 era from 1989 to 2005. By the time our final regular episode comes out, we'll already be in the process of recording our answers to your questions. Questions. So make sure you submit them quickly using the hashtag BringBackV10s on Twitter or by emailing BringBackV10s at the-race.com if you don't want to have to wait for Series 6 to get your next chance. And if you'd like to get early access to ad-free versions of new episodes plus bonus content between series, check out the Race Members Club. Head to the-race.com forward slash members club to find out more about all the benefits you can get by becoming a member. But let's get to Imola 2005. As Mark said there, Ferrari was one of the big topics of interest heading into its first home race of the season, which would be the second appearance of its definitive car, the F2005. The car looked relatively quick on its debut in Bahrain, but it was unreliable. But the speed was promising enough for Ferrari president Luca de Montezemolo to declare Ferrari is back. Michael Schumacher shared that optimism, saying on his website, the F2005 was very good right from the start, but now we understand the car much better and know how to deal with any problems that may arise. Our winning potential with this car is very high. Ross Braun offered a more cautionary view, saying Ferrari wouldn't be capable of an overnight change to get back to the front. He said the rule change for 2005 outlawing tyre changes was not in Ferrari's favour because the rule worked against Ferrari's car concept and Bridgestone's tyre philosophy. He added, it's unrealistic to expect Bridgestone to turn a magic switch and solve the problem. We've got to find solutions with the car as well. We've got to have a better car, we've got to improve the handling, and we've got to have more downforce. We've been caught out, we're beginning to change the concept of the car and the tyre to move much more towards what we now understand we need from the one race tyre. That will take a little time. So Ted, coming into Imola, what was the feeling about Ferrari? Did it feel that after what we'd seen in Bahrain, it would be it wouldn't be long before Schumacher was back to winning ways? In some parts, um, yes, I think so because you know you tend to get with a team that's been dominant in Formula One for a while, and and I think Mercedes these days is a is a is a very good sort of contemporary example. You get a sort of bias confirmation. I don't know if that's the right word of, of expecting the people who've been dominant to to get their act together. So well, it's Ferrari. You know, they've just won have many constructors and drivers championships on the bounce. Michael's a, a seven-time world champion. Of course, they're going to be in there. And, and you know, you had the, 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 the Ferrari press department, led at the time, of course, for a long time by the uh, estimable Luca Colliani, who's back with the Scuderia now uh, as director and head of brand. Um, and he was, you know, briefing about how the, as well as Ross Braun and Luca de Montsemolo, as, as Mark was saying, about how they're on top of the issues and they'll be much better. Um, but what reminds me of was how softly they dealt with that, as you said in your intro, Glenn, the, the latest attempt to, to end Ferrari's dominance. And there was briefing here and there. Maybe you got more of it than I did uh, being on the TV side, Mark. But there was a briefing here and there about suggestions. Oh, well, they've just changed the rules, you know, to, to end our dominance. But nowhere near. Can you imagine? I mean, we, we all live through the changes in the floors to, uh, to, to, to disadvantage the low rate cars 
in, contem in contemporary Formula One recently, and the amount of fuss, both from Mercedes and Aston Martin, that that created, there was nowhere near that amount of fuss coming from Ferrari, which was uh, maybe um, a credit to them. But yes, it was clear that uh, there was an effort to, uh, to end their dominance, um, as you said in your intro. Um, but on the other hand, of being positive about it, for the rest of us, it's really clear that the Renault was just a better car. It, it certainly looked to, to handle the, the front wing, the, the, the raising of the front wing change better. And I think if anybody in the paddock was going to be the one who was going to be challenging the Renault, it looked like the nearest competitor would actually be the McLaren going forward rather than the Ferrari. Yeah, and, and Ross Braun has, has said in several interviews and even in his, his book that he was constantly fighting these fires behind the scenes. But once the rules went through, Ferrari kind of had to lump it and get on with it. And the comparison with 2021 floor changes is, is absolutely right. The amount of fuss we've had in comparison. Whereas I think Ross has even said that, you know, FIA or, or with, with Bernie in the background as well, were, were lobbing grenades at Ferrari all the time when they were winning championships. So, uh, yeah, we'll tell Toto Wolff he doesn't know he was born. Uh, but after three races of the season, Schumacher had just two points and sat 14th in the championship, 24 behind championship leader Fernando Alonso, who'd won two of the opening three races for Renault. Schumacher spoke about Alonso on his website too, saying the events this season have been working in Fernando's favour, but that won't be likely to stay that way. He will have to keep the championship in mind now and will have to handle some situations differently just to make sure he scores some points. I, on the other hand, have nothing to lose so I can attack and push. All the other drivers can take more risks than he can. Alonso didn't look like a man feeling any of that pressure just yet. He said Renault had started the season better than expected and he said he was enjoying the moment with the best opportunity of my career to be in a winning car. But on Ferrari, he said all of us are waiting for the return to victory of Ferrari. The longer they take to catch up, the better for us. But we all know that day will come. So, Mark, was this just Schumacher laying the groundwork with some mind games? And by this stage, did we know enough about Alonso to know if he'd have the resilience to withstand the pressure of chasing a championship? I think Michael probably wanted to believe that, um, you know, the, the, that there was no underlying problem. And certainly, even if he didn't fully believe it, he always liked to project this air of invincibility. So, yeah, probably a bit of both. But... He, he, he would have also known the underlying reality and that, that was that Bridgestone were not going to be able to give him a, a competitive tyre when the track wasn't cool and that, that there was um, short of Bridgestone coming up with a completely new concept of tyre, there, there were going to be um, some difficult days ahead and I, I think that was widely understood even at this early stage um, of, of the, the series. But in terms of Alonso, no, I think we, we, we knew that uh, he was one very, very tough cookie. We knew this already. Um, right from when he got into the Renault in 2003, he showed no compunction whatsoever about going wheel to wheel with Michael and even giving him the odd brake test, as you seem to recall at the Nürburgring in, in that year. So, um no, it was all it was all beautifully poised in in that sense. There was no um, there's no sense that Alonso would be overwhelmed by having to go against the great Schumacher. It was uh, very much, <laughs> you know, the sort of thing he would relish. Schumacher's future was also the subject of discussion heading into Imola. He was contracted until the end of 2006, but Ferrari had tried to get a commitment from him for at least 2007 over the winter and he'd not been ready to sign a new deal. In public, both sides were relaxed in early 2005, with Ferrari boss John Todd saying Schumacher could drive for Ferrari for as long as he wanted and Schumacher saying he knew he had open doors any time he wanted to take a decision. But behind the scenes, Schumacher's delay had sparked Luca de Montezemolo into action to pin down Kimi Raikkonen, who, as we've discussed before, Ferrari had tried to sign to a long-term deal during his first season in 2001. Interestingly, in early 2005, Todd and Schumacher were asked about possible successors to Michael, specifically Alonso. Todd said Alonso was not first on our list, and Schumacher said the private chats he was having inside Ferrari were more about his future than Alonso. Interestingly, this indifference towards Alonso appeared to be a legacy of a failed attempt to sign him previously. In James Allen's brilliant book about Schumacher titled The Edge of Greatness, 
Todd was quoted as saying a deal was agreed for Alonso to become Ferrari's test driver in 2001, only for Todd to later find out Alonso had signed with someone else, of course, meaning Flavio Briatore. So, Ted, are you surprised that Ferrari would still be smarting from that rejection before, uh, from Alonso before he got to F1? Or was this more a case of they, they always thought Kimi was the horse that they'd be backing long term? Not really. Um, not really surprised. I mean, looking back on it, you know, we didn't know the, the difficulties that Michael Schumacher was having with Luca de Montezemolo. But you look at Jean Todd and, um, you know, he's an emotional character, isn't he? And strangely enough, I think Raikkonen was more of a natural Ferrari driver than Fernando Alonso. I think Todd and Alonso uh, were people who, for whom emotion played a sort of large part in their decisions. Um, and from from memory, Alonso was kind of thinking, you know, Mark says, rightly says that we knew how good Alonso was. Um, and we were sort of starting to think, okay, is this the natural progression of of, of top dogs in Formula One, does it go, does the line go, Ayrton Senna, Michael Schumacher, Fernando Alonso? And, and we didn't maybe know enough about Kimi Räikkönen. We thought maybe it might be Kimi Räikkönen who sort of goes, you know, gets the hand, the, the mantle after Michael Schumacher, but it probably was Fernando Alonso. And so the thought of him going to Ferrari as a kind of understudy to Michael Schumacher early on 2001, 2002, it's like, well, hang on. You know, the, you could come in as a prince and learn from the king, maybe, and take over from that. But that was all sort of on, on a bit of a promise for Fernando. I think he thought that, you know, I could go there. Maybe they'll have some space for me. Maybe they won't. I'll always be seen as kind of Michael's understudy. Whereas if you go sign up with Flavio, a guy he got on with, a guy he knows well, he goes to Renault. Renault could make him number one. They, Renault could make him the king immediately. And he didn't have to mess around with being Michael Schumacher's understudy. Whereas, whereas I wonder whether Kimi Raikkonen had sort of his nationality on his on his side for Ferrari, because I think they were quite keen about Finns. I don't know whether it was Jean Tot's rallying past, but um, a strange sort of connection there. But the Mika Salo substitute worked out quite well for Ferrari, hadn't it, way back when? And I think they quite liked the sort of icy approach of Finns. And Kimi was clearly keen on Ferrari as well. You know, he was keen on the brand. The Robertsons, his managers, were were keen on Ferrari and the financial inducements that would come with it. And so I think, yeah, you're right. They were they were more sort of idling towards uh, to Kimi constantly than, than than Fernando. A more immediate change in the driver lineup came at McLaren, where Alex Wurz was called up to compete in his first F1 race since the end of 2000, in place of the injured Juan Pablo Montoya. Pedro De La Rosa had filled in for Montoya in Bahrain, but that was because Wurtz didn't fit in the car properly. This was because he'd been in talks with Jaguar in 2004, so the McLaren design team assumed he was leaving and didn't design the 2005 car with his tall frame in mind. But out of loyalty to Wurtz for all the test work he'd done since 2001, they adapted the car by the time of Imola so he could have a race. Wurtz told some fun stories about this weekend in an article on the McLaren website in 2016. He said that after McLaren blocked his move to Jaguar for the second time during his spell there, he was feeling rebellious, so he grew his hair out as he knew it would bother Ron Dennis. And Wurtz said from the Wednesday to the Saturday of race week at Imola, Ron kept telling him how much better he looked with the shorter hair and even offered to bring a hairdresser to the circuit for him. Wurtz uh, kept declining the offers, so on race day on the grid, Ron told him not to take his helmet off because he didn't want to see his hair. Now, Mark, I'm not going to ask for your expert view on haircuts, but Wurtz finished fourth on the road at Imola, which became third after BAR's exclusion, which we'll come back to later. So hairstyle aside, how well did he perform, given he'd not raced for so long by this point? Yeah, he hadn't raced since 2000. He hadn't raced for five years, um, but he was regularly in the car. He was, In fact, he'd been a big part of the pre-Imola test, which finally unleashed the qualifying pace out of the car because that's what they'd struggled with in the first three races. It was a quick race car immediately, but they couldn't get the tyres to switch on immediately for qualifying. And he'd been um, an intrinsic part of getting that sorted out. So he was a, a very accomplished and uh, competent and safe pair of hands and knew the team and the car very well. Um, he wasn't the absolute fastest out there, but he certainly wasn't slow. He was really the sort of perfect placeholder, really, for an injured Montoya. You were never going to get the fireworks of a, a Kimi Raikkonen or a Montoya from him, but you were always going to get a good measured performance, which 
in that car as it was just beginning to emerge as the rocket ship it became. That was podium territory and he performed as he'd have expected him to, yeah. Over at Sauber, the Swiss team was getting more coverage than it was used to. Now it had Jacques Villeneuve in its driver lineup, but it wasn't necessarily coverage for the right reasons. Team boss Peter Sauber had been quoted by Reuters as saying the relationship between the team and Villeneuve was at a difficult point, although Villeneuve denied this at the time, saying it must have been a badly translated quote. Sauber gave an interview to the media in the run-up to Imola to clarify the situation, and he said the relationship with Villeneuve was agreeable and constructive. There is no friction between us. However, at the end of the year, Villeneuve gave an interview to F1 Racing editor Matt Bishop, where he outlined what was really going on. He said he wasn't happy after the first three races of the year because he'd been told to shut up and get in the car and to drive it the same way teammate Felipe Massa did. Villeneuve admitted that Sauber did say the team weren't happy with him, but he said it was just a heated reaction to a stressful situation from the team boss and it got blown up by the media. Villeneuve said at the end of the year, I'm happy now, but it took a while and at first I wasn't happy. It was a difficult way of working and I really had to force the issue. So Ted, we always knew of Sauber back then as kind of an understated team. So was this combination of a, a driver and a personality like Jack at Sauber always going to be an uneasy fit? Well, first of all, Glenn, I've got to say I'm honoured to be having the uh, being handed the Jacques Villeneuve yeah. <laughs> uh, for this. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, and and you know, it, it turned out probably that. Uh, Jacques Villeneuve should apologise to Reuters' Alan Baldwin. I, I think Baldini was on the scene uh, back in he 2005 was, yeah. because it was not a it was not a badly translated quote. And I think Peter <laughs> Sauber probably did exactly say that. I don't know. You know, it, it, I think Sauber and Villeneuve should have been more harmonious than than it started out as. Um, I mean, there's obviously the very basic kind of emotional. You know, is he used to Swiss people? Yes, he is. You know, he grew up in Villard and he was at boarding school there is where he met Craig Pollock. Um, he knew the Swiss, he knew what they were like. Um, and even now there is the sort of Jacques Villeneuve uh, Sauber connection. His mate, Jan Lafour, here's a fun fact, who was always kind of part of his coterie. It was Craig Pollock, Jacques, Jan Lafour and some of these other guys. Um, is now Sauber from Sauber's commercial director. So uh, there is still a Jacques Villeneuve link deep within Sauber Engineering AG. But um, uh, apart from other, you know, the, the sort of emotional connection to Switzerland, it didn't work out at the beginning because he was told that all of his little foibles were not going to be accepted. You know, whether the simple things, I guess, from the microscopic throttle pedal travel to, to you know, bigger things on how he wanted the setup. Um, I seem to remember he sort of raised about there was friction with uh, Willy Rampf, who was the engineering director back then, and, and they didn't understand each other. As Jack says, I think as the season went on, they came to, to understand and respect each other enough, certainly for a second season uh, in there. But um, yeah, there were disagreements uh, along the road. And, and maybe I think we were surprised when BMW bought the team for 06 that Villeneuve kept with them, because even though he had that P4 at Imola, um, which I think ended up, uh, you might want to fact check this, Mr. Villeneuve expert, but that was his highest finish before he retired, I believe, uh, this race, Imola 05. Um, but at that time, I remember, Mark, do you remember when Kubica turned up and he did this press conference at BMW Sauber and somebody asked him, Robert, what can you bring uh, to the team? Um, and I think they said in, in place of Jack Vilner, he, he said, I can bring speed. And it was the most backhanded. To tell me if I've got that wrong, but it was something like that. It, it, yeah. he, he essentially said he's slow and I'm fast and that's why I'm here. No, that's he did. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jack in subsequent years was referring to that. And, and he's, he said he had no difficulty with uh, Robert in later years, but he said that at that time when he was trying to, get the drive from him he was um he was absolutely uh you know without mercy and would always attack and would always in public belittle jack and always say look he's old he's past it look and uh, look he can't even see properly he's got glasses all the, all all that stuff so yeah no that was absolutely how uh, robert approached that Okay, so I thought that was going to be a nice tee up to talk about how well Jack drove at Imola. We've ended up talking about how he got sacked. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> we'd uh, we'd only had three races in 2005 by this point, but already there was outcry 
that the latest tweak to F1's qualifying format wasn't any good. F1 uh, had two one-shot qualifying sessions over the weekend, one on Saturday afternoon and one on Sunday morning, and the times from both sessions were added together to create the grid. Meetings took place at Imola over what to do, with Ferrari one of the most outspoken critics, perhaps not a surprise. Montezemolo said it was ridiculous to not know who is on pole by Saturday night, and he claimed that the format was damaging interest in F1 more than Ferrari's domination ever did. There was a push from several people involved, including Bernie Eccleston, to go back to the old one-hour format where everyone ran together on low fuel. But F1's chances of getting the unanimous agreement required to make the change at short notice seemed slim. Renault and McLaren, the two teams who would end up contesting that year's championship, were keen uh, to make sure any changes didn't change the competitive order. McLaren boss Ron Dennis said the format of qualifying with race start fuel on board had impacted fuel tank capacity, so going back to low fuel qualifying would give an advantage to anyone with a bigger tank who could then just fill it up for the race. And he was honest enough to admit, we are not going to be particularly happy to accept any solution that goes against us. Renault boss Flavio Briatore said, I won't be changing the system to give advantages to other teams, so either we change it without giving an advantage to anyone or we keep it as it is. And Flavio said he hadn't wanted the format change in the first place, but one-shot qualifying had been brought in to give more TV exposure to the smaller teams. Now, Ted, I've, Mark and I have discussed one-shot qualifying in previous episodes, so we'll get your view on this. What did you think of one-shot qualifying in general, but also in particular this aggregate version we had at the start of 2005. Well, I found it as bemusing and frustrating as everybody else. Frustrating um, because Flavio's right. You know, they changed the the original format because everybody would stay in the pits. You know, when you had 12 laps and effectively three laps each, so you had four runs, one hour, low fuel, everyone would stay in the pits, go out at, at the end, and then you might not know that some of the uh, sm- smaller teams had actually been out there unless they'd gone out early to get some TV coverage. So that's why they changed it. They never asked TV people. So we were there as as broadcasters. No one ever said to us, you know, what do you think? What do you want? Um, and we found it as frustrating and 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 not great for TV. Maybe not quite as uh, to the lengths that De Montezemolo put it, but um, uh, we found it not great for TV as, as everybody else. And um, you couldn't be uh, convinced that people were going to tune in for the second qualifying session because you know, people have got things to do with their lives. They can't constantly be watching one qualifying session and then another one uh, the next day to find out who's on pole. So yeah, it wasn't good for us. We didn't like it. We wanted to go back to the to the twelve lap four run uh, version. Um, all right, the t- smaller teams, you know, might have got coverage with the one lap qualifying, but then those eyeballs were watching it, were watching a not great qualifying format. And I think that was more damaging and confusing than having uh, the original time, uh, the original version when they didn't all get coverage. It did have a a direct bearing on um, this particular weekend because the reason that Michael was down in 13th on the grid was that he'd gone off on the Saturday qualifying lap. And had we had it just been the the single qualifying session, he um, I think on Friday he'd been third, so that that was about his his natural um, p- qualifying pace uh, that that weekend. Um, the 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 fourteenth was because he'd, he'd gone off on um, at, at the second chicane and lost about four seconds. Yeah, that was the upside. Uh, if there was one to one shot qualify, it did jumble the grids occasionally. But uh, I should give a, a quick shout out, I think, to Nick Fry of BAR because it wasn't long after this that he was credited with suggesting some sort of segmented knockout format which is what we ended up with for 2006 and still have today. Reigning F3000 champion Tonio Liuzzi would make his F1 race debut at Imola swapping places with Christian Klein in the second Red Bull seat alongside David Coulthard. This was planned in advance by Red Bull as a way of evaluating two young drivers in its first season in F1 after taking over Jaguar's team. However, the seat swapping led to speculation that Red Bull's ultimate plan was to have Clean and Liuzzi as its driver lineup for 2006, with Coulthard being moved aside after just one year with the team. Coulthard wrote in his book that even before he signed for Red Bull, Red Bull's Helmut Marko was pushing for the young guns to fill the team's lineup, but DC had the support of team owner Dietrich Mateschitz and team boss Christian Horner. In response to the speculation at Imola, Horner told Reuters, David is one of the top drivers in Formula One. We're fortunate to have him, and he's a great benchmark for the other two. 
We had dinner with David on Monday and Mr. Matuschitz reaffirmed how content he was with David then. He's the stability in terms of development and continuity. David has nothing to prove. He's an integral part of the team and he's part of the success we've had so far. So, Mark, how important was it for Red Bull to have a driver like Coulthard in its lineup in those early years when the team was still finding its feet in F1? Yeah, he did bring plenty to the party and his presence there was very much part of Adrian Newey's later arrival there because they'd formed a good bond at McLaren and, and DC would be a, a conduit for getting Adrian to take another look at the team that he'd almost joined when it was Jaguar. So, also, the young drivers that they had, uh, Liuzzi and Clean. They weren't ready to give direction to a team. The, you, you, the, if you just put those two in that year in, instead of DC, um, the, they, they would have got lost. Um, they, and ultimately, they didn't really have a performance advantage over someone like DC. You know, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't an idiot. He was. He, he's not the absolute fastest, but he, he still brought a level of performance, and he, he brought a, a good knowledge of you know, how you should how you should run the weekend and how the car should be. So. Um, it would have been a, maybe a more difficult choice if you'd had the equivalent of a young Vettel or of a Stappen just bursting to come through. Um, but DC was able to bring a direction and a stability in how they worked. Horner was absolutely right to keep them there. And and Red Bull and DC at that stage in his career was, was about the right stage for each other. It's a, sort of a bit like Bottas and Alfa Romeo now. They were just, you know, DC wasn't, no, he's no longer going to get a, a drive in an absolute top team. Um, but he was still had he still had plenty to offer, and the Red Bull needed the experience of someone as as it made its way up um, that that knew how a, a top team operated. So no, it was they, they were they were right for each other at that time. There was more Red Bull news at Imola as it announced uh, it was announced that the team would be switching from Cosworth to Ferrari engines for two thousand and six. We never really hear from Matchitz today as he lets the F1 team get on with its business. But in Red Bull Racing's early days, he did give a few interviews as he battled to establish the team's profile and credibility. On the Ferrari deal, he said, we could basically choose which engine we wanted to have. The decision was not really hard to take since Ferrari is the most charismatic team in the world with one of the strongest engines. I don't have to go into details about the marketing value of Ferrari. Horner expanded on the decision, saying Red Bull was concerned about Cosworth's ability to match F1's big manufacturers in the switch to V8 engines for 2006, and he said it was a sign of Red Bull's intent for the future and its commitment to competing at the front in F1. So, Ted, we're only a few races into Red Bull existing on the grid as its own team at this point. Was this a smart move to show how seriously it was taking F1? I thought, I thought you were going to say we're only a few races into Red Bull existing and already we've got an engine change for Red Bull. So, <laughs> yeah, no surprise there. Um, and, uh, you know, good old Dietrich Matchitz, you know, forever, forever the toothpaste salesman as he started out in Austria to be, you know, talking about charisma. Well, charisma is going to win new races in world championships, isn't it, Dietrich? But in any case, no, I mean, it was I think it was more of a sign from my, what I remember of, of how they were separating slowly from that sort of Jaguar hangover, the Ford and the Cosworth relationship. Um, they took the Cosworth on because it was all part, it fitted uh, the Jaguar tub and, the, and they were used to doing it, but they were looking around for engines after that. Um, yes, certainly. And I guess, you know, dumping Cosworth was just casualty of that legacy. Certainly, I think the switch to V8s was a concern. Um, but Horner, even at that tender age, so he would have been his same age as me or just a few months older. So 31, 32 years old, only then um, in charge. I think when he took over from Red Bull, he was 31. So I think he probably would have been 32 by 2005. He knew even at that tender age that a customer Ferrari wasn't going to be inevitably on the same level as a works Ferrari. But it was the change to the V8s that I think convinced him and Mataschitz, I suppose, by, by extension uh, and Helmut Marco that they couldn't have time, they wouldn't be able to have time, Ferrari, to build a, a works version of a V8 and then sort of dumb it down to have a, have, a, have a customer version of the V8. There just wouldn't be time for them to be disadvantaged by being a Ferrari customer. But um, yeah, uh, they might have thought they would have been with Ferrari for a, a while, but uh, they, they weren't. There was another engine switch down the road, wasn't there, to Renault? Yeah, quite a short-lived partnership. I think, as you said, marketing was was always in Dietrich's mind. And I think he did like the sound of Red Bull Ferrari. Sounded very 
glamorous. But when that deal mm. was announced, Ferrari boss Jean Todd praised Red Bull's determination, motivation and enthusiasm. And he also said the deal fit with Ferrari's recent history of being willing to supply engines to customer teams. Talking of Ferrari engine deals, there were rumours that its current customer, Sauber, was in talks with BMW. Crucially, at this stage, these talks were apparently about a customer engine supply rather than the BMW takeover of the team that became official that summer. At Imola, BMW boss Mario Tyson said there was more than a 50% chance of BMW supplying Sauber with engines, but he said BMW's close relationship with Williams, which he said went beyond engine supply, of course, was not set to change. So, Mark, can you imagine a scenario where BMW and Williams stayed together beyond 2005 and Sauber took a customer engine supply? Or do you think this was BMW already exploring its options to get away from Williams? No, the damage was already done. The only way BMW was prepared to continue with Williams was if it had full control. And there was no way on God's earth that Frank and Patrick were going to give them that. This was their team one of the most successful in F1 history, and they weren't ready to either retire or become employees. BMW felt that there were management limitations at Williams, which could only be corrected if they had control. And you can feel the culture clash there. You know, the the Germanic, this is how we're going to do it. And and the very British way of of Frank and Patrick. And so there was this culture clash and a a personality clash. Um, You know, they, they, they didn't warm to each other at all. The, the two, two sides, even when they were having a reasonable degree of success together. Um, Peter Sauber was much more amenable to the idea of BMW taking over, and it was a, a very good base. Peter had wisely recently invested, I think he paid 50 million, 50 million euros in a state-of-the-art wind tunnel, um, and it was already a it was already a very good base. So was, as long as BMW could come to a deal with Peter, they were out of Williams. There was no, there was no going back. Back to McLaren, and there was news of a contract extension for its design genius, Adrian Newey, but it was believed to be only a short-term extension that would take his contract to the end of the year. In a statement, McLaren said Newey would step back from his hands-on role and would participate in the long-term reorganisation of the technical function whatever that means. <laughs> Newey said in his book that by 2005, he was disillusioned at McLaren, where he was unhappy with the matrix structure that had been brought in after, as we mentioned earlier, he tried to leave for Jaguar in 2001. Newey wrote, I was getting to the point where I was losing my mojo. I was having to force myself rather than it coming naturally. Never a good sign. By this time, I'd come to the conclusion that I needed to be out of McLaren. Now, as we mentioned, it wasn't long before Adrian signed for Red Bull. But Ted, given that Newey has proven even today to still be capable of designing championship winning F1 cars with Red Bull, do you think McLaren mishandled him in his final years they had together? I don't know whether mishandling him is is the right word, because I think Ron Dennis tried absolutely everything he could to keep him. He was he could see that Adrian was unhappy. He'd had the early offer from um from Jaguar to go there, which he turned down. And, you know, Ron would sort of try and come up with ways to keep him uh, engaged and keep him interested. But I think that it just he just lost interest. It, it, there was a move away when he went to, to McLaren, first of all, from Williams. It was a very different atmosphere. It was maybe a more professional team than they had a Mercedes engine that's working for them. And, you know, it was all running very nicely. DC, Hakkinen, it was all great. And it just started to get a bit difficult the cars got smaller and tighter and there were mistakes made here and there. Um, and with Ron and Norbert at the top, I think Adrian started to feel that he just wasn't sort of getting anywhere near having more of a say or being more involved. And he just fallen out of love with it, really, I think. And he got this offer of, um, you know, it's like an internet meme of seeing a girl across the street, you know. And it's, there was this great, you know, fresh, young, new girl that he could see with... Christian Horner's face on. Hang on, that, that sounds really weird. Let me let me go back. Let me go back to that. <laughs> um, and uh, it, but, but my point. Let me word it slightly uh, uh, better. There was an opportunity for a fresh start with Red Bull, and Horner did an amazing job in convincing him that he was going to have the freedom to do what he wanted. And I think it was that creative freedom that he craved and was worried about. I remember something Adrian knew. He said, "I can't remember when it, whether it was in his brilliant book or not." Um, but he said that he 
what would keep him awake sometimes at night would not be about, you know, how to package a, a rear damper or anything like that, but he'd be worried about where the next creative impulse was going to come from. And as a, a you know, self-styled creative person myself, I have to, my producers want me to come up with features um, now and again, or rather every weekend for, for our TV programs. I kind of know what Adrian's thinking. You know, you need to, if you start thinking about it and you start worrying about where your next idea for a feature is going to come from, you can be in trouble because that's your bread and butter. Uh, and, and I think maybe Adrian was, was concerned that he was running out of ideas and he needed a fresh start, which is what he got at Red Bull. Somebody, somebody of, of our, in our audience needs to make that Christian Horner, Adrian Newey meme and uh, tag tag Ted Kravitz in it. I definitely want someone uh, yeah. can make that for us. <laughs> yeah, you know the one with that with with the guy and his girlfriend who looks at him. The guy's looking at another girl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we all know that. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll, so not not quite as disgraceful a, a, a reference as it sounded when I said. No, it. Sorry. So that. over to you. Bring back <laughs> V10's audience. Let's get that made. Newey's MP420 was starting to show signs of its true potential at Imola, as Mark mentioned earlier, with Kimi Raikkonen taking pole position ahead of Alonso and Jensen Button's BAR. The other big story of qualifying that we briefly mentioned earlier was Schumacher going off at Rivazza on his Sunday lap, so he would start 13th, having been third after Saturday qualifying. This was Raikkonen's big chance to kickstart McLaren's season, and Newey said McLaren had started to unlock the potential of the car by evolving the setup after struggling to extract performance from it in the opening races. There didn't seem to be any problem with extracting performance from it in the opening laps of this race as Raikkonen charged away at the front. However, his race lasted only nine laps when a drive shaft joint failed. McLaren apologised to Raikkonen publicly, although Newey revealed years later that he felt the failure had occurred because Raikkonen dropped the clutch with far more revs that on it than he ever had done before, which overloaded the transmission system. Newey added, Something like that you can view one of two ways. You could say, we should have made the car strong enough to take such abuse, and had we known, we would have done. The problem is, no driver had ever done anything like that previously, so the issue had never come up before. So Mark, Adrian says you can view it one of two ways. Which way would you view it? Kimmy's fault for too many revs or should McLaren's parts have been able to sustain that punishment? Well, they'd already changed two drive shafts that weekend. So I guess Kimmy should have been nursing it a bit. But on the other hand, he was starting on the front row with Alonso alongside him. And Alonso and the Renault, which was a, a rearward heavy car, had fantastic traction. So he could not afford to get stuck behind Alonso because he, you know, it's impossible to pass, as Michael would later prove. So it was absolutely crucial that he nail that start. And then his day was quite straightforward. So, uh, yeah, you can understand that he was um, he, he, he wasn't thinking in terms of how can I be as easy as the drive shaft as possible in, in that moment. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's just that's the context of uh, what happened there. Raikkonen's retirement left Alonso pretty comfortable out front, so he turned down his engine as Renault were nursing a problem all weekend. Button was in a pretty lonely second, but was able to keep pace with the Renault once Alonso backed off. Behind them, we had another example of the famous Trilli train. Jano Trilli's Toyota was running third, holding up a queue of cars all the way back to Rubens Barrichello in eighth. To be fair to Trulli, both he and Toyota had predicted they would struggle at Imola because they didn't expect their car to get on well with the kerbs there, and he said he was surprised to qualify as high as fifth. No one had been able to get past Trulli, and by the time he made his first pit stop, he was already 30 seconds off the lead, so Alonso and Button looked clear out front. One man who hadn't been part of the train was Michael Schumacher, as he'd been stuck slightly further back in 11th behind Nick Heidfeld's Williams and the other Toyota of Ralph Schumacher. But as all the cars in the Trulli train pitted, Schumacher stayed out, running until lap 27, when he came into the pits and rejoined ahead of them all in third. But Mark, Schumacher didn't make any progress on track during that first stint, so was he lucky that Trulli had bunched up the pack in front of him. Exactly that, yes. The Trulli train helped him out enormously. It, it brought cars into his reach, which would have taken ages to catch had they been spread out. So he was able to just undercut past the whole lot of them at the first stops because they were so closely bunched. And um, then at the second stops, he was able to go seven laps longer than Alonso. And that, it wasn't all that far off being able to overcut into the lead. So 
Um, the Bridgestones were just working so much better than the Michelins on the day. And truly, the, oh, we, we talk about the truly train, and there was, yes, there was an aspect of Yarno um, traits in that, in that he tended to, um, uh, if the car wasn't perfectly balanced, he, he would magnify a, a, a problem. It would a, 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 maybe a, a, a problem that was a tenth of a second, he would maybe would maybe make into a half a second but when when the car was perfectly balanced he was fantastically quick but the bigger problem from that day was just the tire dig on the rear tires and that was that that bunched everybody up so yeah um michael had put himself in the mid pack where the, the car didn't belong he it, it, it was as we said earlier it should have been qualifying sort of on the second row um, but that um, that was that truly train allowed it allowed that not to um, to matter very much as it happened. So as Mark outlined there, what followed from Schumacher over the middle stint of the race was phenomenal. After his stop, he was 31 seconds behind Alonso and 22 behind Button. But throughout this stint, he was lapping between 1.5 and two seconds faster than anyone on track. Renault's Pat Simmons said afterwards that this was because Schumacher suffered no tyre degradation for about 20 laps. And by lap 42, he was on Button's tail. And they were the front two cars in the race now, as Alonso had already stopped. Button kept Schumacher at bay for a few laps, and Ferrari were out in the pits, ready to make an early stop when Button got balked by the two Williamses, and Schumacher pounced on the run to Varianti Alta chicane to take the lead. Two laps later, Button came in, and a lap after that, Schumacher pitted, having been 15 seconds clear of Alonso. That proved to be just enough for Alonso to retake the lead as Schumacher appeared at the pit exit. So now it was a dash to the flag. But Ted, you were in the thick of this. You were down in the pit lane while all of this was going mm, on with yeah. Ferrari abandoning the early stop. Then Schumacher coming in, Alonso flashing past the pits to take the lead. What was it like being down there in amongst it all? Well, it was building very nicely. You know, it had all been sort of slightly becalmed um, earlier on as Schumacher had, um, had struggled to get his way through all of that traffic. But, you know, as, as I remember the, the, the Tifosi on the hill um, on the inside of, of Rivazza 2, uh, they were all a bit quiet to start with. But, you know, then they realised what was happening and people could see the lap times that Michael was doing and how closer he was getting uh, to Alonso at the front. And then they saw, as you as you saw, the race was on to the flag and everybody started to get more and more excited. And even though at Imola back in 05, we were in the old pits, which were about, what, 300 metres further towards Tamburello rather than the new pits now, which are a bit more towards the exit of Rivazza 2. You could hear them screaming on the inside, those sort of standing area on the inside of that hill at Rivazza 2. They're really, the Tifosi, they're really getting more and more excited. And I remember I was in the McLaren garage because I had a... Um, arrangement with their team uh, team manager, sporting director Dave Ryan, that uh, that I could be in there, and I was standing by the sort of abandoned car of Kimi Raikkonen, and McLaren had um, two Italian people in their garage. There was the scrutineer, who was obviously a Ferrari fan, who was getting more and more excited <laughs> about what was going on, and was coming to me and asking what the time difference was because he didn't dare ask any of the McLaren mechanics because they were all <laughs> extremely annoyed of how the race had turned out. Um, and uh, and then there was the fireman at the front. Uh, I, I, I remember he was, wearing, he was wearing the the orange thing, the CEA, wasn't it, Mark? The the, the Italian fireman. Mm. They've got that little um, cartoon lion logo on the back of their on the back of their, uh, their their overalls. And this fireman at the front of the McLaren garage was getting more and more excited. So I was dealing with these two Italians, seeing what Michael was doing um, a few garages down because it was. I remember it was McLaren. Uh, was the fifth garage back then. Ferrari, obviously, constructors champions from from two thousand and four. Then it was BAR next to them, then Renault, then Williams. And so McLaren was sort of down towards uh, the end. But you could feel the tension. As Murray Walker, the late great Murray Walker would put it, you can feel the tension. You could cut the atmosphere with a cricket stump. I love that line from Murray. <laughs> no. yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the rest of the race was absolutely fascinating. Schumacher was all over the back of Alonso, showing his nose wherever he could. But there was no way through. And Alonso said in a special feature about this race for F1 TV in 2021 that at any circuit other than Imola, it would not have been possible to hold on. Earlier, we mentioned that Renault were managing an engine issue on Alonso's car, as this was the first season where engines had to last two full weekends. But for the final stint, Alonso said Renault gave him whatever power was available at that point. 
As if that wasn't enough, Alonso could also see backmarkers ahead, and he was deliberately slowing down in certain parts of the track where Schumacher couldn't try to pass him so they wouldn't catch the backmarkers. Mark, Fernando was clearly juggling a lot here. How impressed were you by his performance? I know you've written in the past about passing the torch moments in F1 history. Was this one of those? He was juggling with a lot, yeah. And they, the the engine, actually, they, they'd actually considered changing it and taking the 10 place grid drop. That's how serious it was. It was the same problem that had hold a piston in Fissy's car the previous race. So, so, yeah, it was a drive of control and initially just being in a safe second, no threat to Kimi, and then assuming a handy lead, but on tyres that were always a little too cold and prone to graining. So he was just driving to the tyres the way that they would do later with um, control tyres um, in, in, in later years. But it, it, it that wasn't typical of how you raced a tyre war Michelin. It was just because of the circumstances that weekend. And it was just too cold, and they would blister. I did not blister the grain, um, but the Bridgestones. This was the perfect weather because they ran hotter than the Michelins, which was usually their big problem because it increased the wear. But here, heat was exactly what you wanted, and it was just that the Michelins that were wearing because of the graining. So, when Schumacher was up to second, Alonso had a real fight on his hands because that car, as you say, was big, big chunks quicker, one and a half seconds maybe towards two seconds faster if it could get past so he had a real fight on his hands and he was managing the traffic perfectly just his mastery of the situation was was total um it was a beautiful drive a beautiful defensive drive um was it a torch passing moment for me not symbolically no for me that was 130r later in the season at suzuka when he we passed michael around the outside at 208 miles per hour but he was yeah, he was clearly Michael's um, the, the pretender to Michael's throne. So yeah, it was it was already there was already that symbolism about the fight. Um, where I th- I, but I, I think the way the uh, the outcome was decided in Alonso's favour didn't didn't say that. Yeah, he's done it. It, it just said that you know this is a. This, this, this could be a battle for the ages. I, I love the idea of of trying not to catch the back markers as if you haven't got enough on your plate already. Also in the yeah. F1 TV interview, Alonso said after the race, his feeling towards Schumacher was, OK, now we have a championship because the champion is back fighting for wins. That sentiment was shared on the Ferrari pit wall because in the season review DVD, you see footage of Schumacher's engineer Chris Dyer declaring at the end of the race, we're back. Despite losing the race, Schumacher was in good spirits afterwards. Any disappointment he had didn't come from failing to overtake Alonso at the end. It was more to do with the off in qualifying that cost him so many places on the grid. But of the battle with Alonso, he said, this is honestly one of the good races from my career. And I have said many times that you don't always need to win a race to enjoy it. It was an exciting fight. I was not expecting to be that much quicker. I had a couple of areas where I thought I could have a go. I tried, got close in a couple of corners, but he did a great race and no mistakes. We got second place, we had stunning pace, and this is what we take out of this race. This was the first step, and there is more to come. Michael was asked at the end of the post-race press conference if this performance meant Ferrari and Bridgestone had cured their problems, and he simply responded, obviously we have cured our problem, otherwise we would not have been able to do what we did. So Ted, Alonso thought Ferrari were back, the Ferrari pit wall thought it was back, and Schumacher said they'd cured their problems. Was the feeling in the paddock that Schumacher would be a factor for the rest of 2005 as he had been this weekend? Probably not entirely, no. I mean, I think on TV we were happy to go along with what Ferrari was saying, to report that they're saying that we're back because, you know, it was good uh, for the show. It was good to have Ferrari against Renault, against McLaren, against anybody else who wanted to get their act together in 2005. That was absolutely perfect tonic for the sort of Ferrari domination of 03 and 04 before that. So we were happy to play along with what Ferrari was saying. But um, no, I think I think people were thinking that you know it, 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 there were the extenuating circumstances about the temperature and the Bridgestones that Mark was talking about, and also you know, how could Bridgestone, even with all the testing that Ferrari were able to give them, have been able to turn it around in in that short space of time to make significant changes to the tire? Inherently, they didn't have the sort of flat contact patch of the Michelin uh, 
um, that worked so well for the for the Michelins. But I guess Michael, Michael Schumacher had to keep the morale up, didn't he? He had to say we're back. He had to say, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be winning more races. But I think, you know, going into the rest of the European season, it's probably Raikkonen and McLaren that, that we thought would offer the more strenuous uh, challenge to Alonso for the rest of 05. What about you, Mark? Was there any part of you that thought, OK, that they're on the way back now? Or did you just think it's it's freak circumstances of the of the conditions? I was more inclined towards the latter, but, you know, you, you, you never know. The pattern of that race was more that there was a clear problem with the Michelin. There they was, um, it had huge degradation, which, which just was very untypical. So although the Michael's tyres were working very well and that accentuated the difference, it was clearly a, an untypical problem and it, the, the cool weather seemed to be the most likely culprit. And through the season, that, that wasn't going to be enough to, uh, to, to carry the, the Bridgestone deficit. Yeah, I think even... Uh... Even if we didn't think Ferrari were properly back, we probably didn't envisage that 2005 would go as badly as it did for the whole season. But this was one of the most exciting finishes to a Grand Prix ever. Unfortunately, sorry, Ted, if you were watching it in the UK, you missed laps 60 and 61 out of 62. <laughs> this was because broadcaster uh, ITV still had one ad break. Yeah. It was obliged to get in before the race finished. The channel had delayed taking its final break after Schumacher's second stop in the hope that the battle would be resolved early in the final stint. But when Alonso continued to hang on, ITV was effectively backed into a corner. The coverage resumed from the break as Alonso and Schumacher started the final lap. And of course, in the end, the viewers didn't miss anything, but ITV released a statement afterwards explaining its contractual commitment to the set number of ad breaks and apologising for any frustration it might have caused the viewers. Now, before we come to Ted on this and, and make him relive the pain, uh, Mark, you were in the commentary box with James Allen and Martin <laughs> Brundle when this happened. They had to keep commentating through the ad break as other international broadcasters took the UK commentary. What was it like being in there as you could probably see and feel this situation unfolding? It was a situation everyone had long been dreading it, because of the, you know, the, the contractual obligation for the adverts. It, it was always bound to happen one day, so it wasn't like, oh, what's going on here? It was more, oh, this is the day. This is the day when that's going to happen. Obviously, as the stint went on, the decision got more and more agonising, and there's inevitably a feeling of anything we do is probably going to be wrong. So that negative pressurised feeling was steadily building. It wasn't nice. Okay, Ted, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. It's the poorly timed ad break moment. Well, um, <laughs> funnily enough, what are we, 16, 17 years later? Um, nobody's actually ever asked me about this. So um, uh, I've got. Uh, if we can term it as a little bit of an exclusive, I can exclusively reveal to you, Glenn, that it was my fault. Um, oh, well, all right. It wasn't part. It wasn't totally my fault. Let me let me let, hang on. Let me let me rephrase that. I could have prevented it happening. It was partly my fault. Let me explain the way the way it worked. So our our program editor Gerard Lane, who was extremely um, well experienced and 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 uh, you know a brilliant program editor, decided where the breaks were going to be, and it would be in conjunction in in in, in uh, conjunction with with myself in the pits, who would have time to talk to him. Um, and advise when was the best time. James Allen and Martin Brundle in the commentary box when they could get a word in edgeways, and Mark Hughes also in the commentary box who had talked back to Gerard and who could advise him as well. So these were the people he took, Gerard took advice from. And, and the way to do it, we always found the best way was to get a, one break away. We were committed to five advert breaks in, an, in, in, a, in, a, in a race, um, two and a half minutes plus, uh, plus a promo on either, either side of it, made it about, about, about two, two minutes 45. So if you could get a break, break away in the first stint before the first stops, then you were doing well. And I think from memory, we didn't manage to do that because we were just about to go to a break when Kimi retired on lap. I think it was six or was it six or seven? Something like that. Glenn, you've got it in front of you. Seven or eight. I think seven. from watching the coverage, you came back from a break as Kimmy had stopped or as he yeah, was slowing okay. down. So we'd already, so we'd already missed something <laughs> in there. Had we gone earlier, the, it, you should always get a breakaway you know, early. And of course, you're never going to know when something like that is going to happen. So we can't foresee the future, but we can foresee 
uh, pit stops and strategy and when people uh, are going to pit. So we, we we had one around the Kimi Raikkonen retirement. Then we took another one around Fernando Alonso. Then there was a period when Jensen was in the lead, which was still at that time a bit of a novelty. So they didn't want to uh, take a break when James and Martin were going on about not going on, they were, going, they were going off on one about how Jensen was in the lead and it was an exciting time. We had a British driver in the lead. We hadn't had that uh, for a long time, of course. So um, it was it, it was good. It was it was it was exciting stuff. And then that meant that we got uh, to the point where Michael was coming through. He overtook Jensen quite easily, as you said, because he was bought by the Williams. And maybe that gave us a false sense of, well, this is going to happen quite quickly, because when he came up behind Fernando, we thought, look, his car's working well. Fernando might be struggling a bit on on his Michelins. It's going to happen quite quickly. And that's where the rot started to set in. And Gerard was asking me, what do you think? And I was saying, hold on a bit, which is where I say it might have been my fault. Um, Whereas I should have said, and I don't know what he was asking you, Mark, just go for it. Go for it early, because if we miss it, okay, we'll miss it. But, you know it's difficult to overtake ground here. And maybe that was the mistake we made, um, Mark, that we didn't give too much weight to the fact that Alonso was going to be brilliant in defence and that Imola was very difficult to overtake because we've relived that moment. I've relived it so many times. I'm sure, sure Gerard has, um, so even though it's 17 years ago. And had we just taken it as soon as we could early, then we would have been fine. But as you say, we just waited and waited and waited, thinking, oh, well, he's going to get him the next lap. He's going to get him the next lap. He's going to get him. It's like when you're in a in, in a in a in a traffic jam and you're thinking, it's okay, let's just give it another minute. You know you're in a traffic jam. You know you should turn around and go on a different route. You're just thinking, it's okay, it'll get better, it'll get better, it'll get better. It'll happen, it'll happen. And it never did. I don't know. What are your did, well, Mark, what were your discussions with Gerard on the on the talk back? I don't remember my specific discussions, but I just um, remember that feeling that the the shape of the race had just had us over and and just um you know the the the, the phase where michael had suddenly bounced by, by everyone and um at the first stops and come into the picture uh it, it the the critical things kimmy kimmy's retirement from the lead uh, michael jumping past everyone at the first stops um the, jensen leading as you said the, all those things just all combined in the worst possible way to give us a misleading picture about what was happening at the end. And uh, but it was too late. We're already in that situation. But um, by the time it was that that was understood. So yeah, I from memory I don't think I was having a direct discussion with Gerard at that time. I think it was probably he was probably busy talking with with you and Martin because um, <laughs> any tough information from me. Well, I think Martin probably would have been supporting it, but um, because you know when, when he wasn't on mic, when when James was talking, I remember Martin was quite heavily into discussion with Gerard. So, um, yeah, I I, th- I think the whole the whole thing was just it was just a, a cons- everything conspired to just um, block us into that corner, and there was no getting out of it. What, what by the time you realised the corner you were in, there was really no getting out of it yeah it wasn't good the plane home from Bologna airport that uh, that evening wasn't good Gerard went um uh, he he didn't mope he actually he got sort of quite sort of silly about it and was like oh it doesn't matter you know ha oh, we all had a sort of laugh on the plane even though clearly we we're all gutted about it but you know we had 12 years at F1 ITV five advert breaks per race which seems amazing now that we actually managed to squeeze that in um average of what 17 18 races that's a thousand advert breaks in races in in the 12 years. This is the only one where we really look back on it. We think that was an absolute howler that we should have seen coming. Breakdowns, I think we were on an advert break when Michael lost the championship in Fuji, in uh, Suzuka, I think in 99, was it? Or was it 98? I can't remember. 98, the puncture. Was it 98? Yeah. So we were on a break there, but A, that was in Japan and we fixed it for the replay. Uh, later on in the uh, in the afternoon when we did the replay, so only you know the three hundred thousand people who were who were joining us live missed that. I think you can count on the on the fingers of one hand the number of times we missed out as our advert breaks, which out of a thousand breaks isn't too badly. Ridiculously, we were caught, we were cautioned, or we were told off by Ofcom uh, for breaking rule point six six point seven uh, on amount and scheduling of adverts and sporting events, which which was treated with the absurdity. Uh, which it was uh, it was deserved, totally deserved 
um, at ITV Towers because the rule was you should only take advert breaks where the, there's a change of focus, of, a shift of, of focus in, in the sport from one point to another. Um, and we kind of got around that in Formula One. James would, or Murray would say, OK, so it's lap 12. Uh, Alonso in the lead, funded by Michael Schumacher, Kimi Raikkonen, uh, Giancarlo Fiskella, and Jensen Button. And we create our own sort of change of point uh, where you could say, OK, now we're going to go to a break. But there was never going to be. In motor racing, you're never going to get a change of shift from one point of another, save, of course, of a safety car and a, or a red flag, which was gold dust to us trying to take five bad boat breaks um, in a race. So uh, I think Ofcom felt, I mean, I can't talk for them. I've got no idea what they're thinking. But they probably felt, you know, we've got to do something to, to appease the viewers who are annoyed that we took a break. But uh, it, was a, it was a nonsensical uh, caution or a telling off that they gave us. Yeah, I think these days with the amount of safety cars we get, it would probably be be easier uh, than it was back then. But I love, thanks uh, firstly, Ted, for the the exclusive. We love that on Bring Back V10s. <laughs> I love that that story started with you taking responsibility, but then you managed to take Mark down with you. And then I think Mark managed to take <laughs> Martin down with him at the end as well. So <laughs> let's, let's blame it on lots of people. We were all responsible. No, it was. I, I, could have, I could have changed it. I could have changed their course of history and we wouldn't be discussing it. If, if only I'd have said, Gerard, Let's go for it. Go for it early. You'll never be in trouble if you go for it early. And that's been the, the advice that I've given to successive uh, program editors ever since then. It's just get it out of the way early because Imola 005 has hung in my head ever since. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for revisiting it for us. Now, uh, if ITV thought they were having a bad day, that was nothing in comparison to, to BAR. The stewards took six hours to clear Button's third place car on Sunday night as when all the fuel was drained out of it, it was underweight. Eventually, the stewards accepted an explanation from BAR about why this had happened, but once the car was cleared, the FIA appealed against its own stewards so a full investigation could take place. Back in 2005, the weight limit was 600 kilograms. Button's car weighed 606.1 with fuel in it, but only 594.6 when the fuel was pumped out. The FIA considered this to be a case of BAR deliberately trying to gain an illegitimate and unfair advantage by using fuel as ballast, which was outlawed in the regulations. It accused the team of designing a fuel system calculated to deceive the scrutineers into thinking the car had been drained of fuel when in fact it had not, which the FIA called fraudulent conduct. Before the appeal hearing, the FIA said its suggestion to the court was to exclude BAR from the championship and issue a fine of at least $1 million. BAR denied deliberately breaking the rules and team boss Nick Fry was confident that its evidence, which included showing that the FIA was aware of its system previously, would result in the team being cleared. So Ted, we'll come to the court's verdict in a moment, but can you just explain to the audience what was the system BAR had on its car and why was the team so sure it was legal? Well, this was the famous six kilo collector tank. So um, they claimed and Honda uh, backed them up. Honda said, you know, look, our, our engine, um, the fuel pump that we've got requires uh, us to have six kilos of fuel, which was a huge amount um, in a collector uh, tank ready to be pumped straight in uh, to the engine. Now, Various people from uh, other, pe other other teams, the technical director of a rival team, described that to me as utter nonsense. Um, and um, William, I remember if you look on YouTube, there's a there's a feature I did for the for the race, uh, the first of the two races that BR Honda had been uh, banned from, which was Spain the weekend after. So you had Williams drivers, Mark Webber, you had McLaren drivers, Juan Pablo Montoya. You have Mike Gascoigne quoted on there saying, you know, look, you know, they were they were playing around with something there. But there were people, I think David Coulthard was giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but they would always be, the BAR as they found it, they would always be uh, heavy on fuel effectively at the end of the race because they their zero fuel weight was, as you say, 594 or 593 or something like that, which enabled them to run underweight during the race they could have run underweight during the race and that's you know, what mark will agree it's one of the oldest tricks in the book you're running underweight in a race where nobody can actually stop you scrutineer can't come out and say oh excuse me would you like to stop on the weighing scales so i can see your weight now as it was bar were able to prove with data and fuel consumption and all of this that they were not running underweight in the middle of the race but there was this fishy element about this 
six kilo collector tank in the middle of their fuel tank, which was very difficult to get to. They had a look at it with a, with a boroscope or an endoscope and they couldn't see. There was a baffle and a flap to get to it. It was pretty well hidden. They were, there was a lack of transparency, I think, which was what they were finally uh, done for um, on the FIA rather than anything sort of deliberate cheating uh, like that. But that was, was what it was all about. But I don't remember, Mark, do you, was there a, a suspicion in the paddock um, about sort of long final fuel uh, stops? Because that was, would have been the giveaway. I remember thinking at the time, the giveaway maybe in Malaysia or Bahrain earlier in the year, if they pit for a second time or final time, and there's a suspiciously long hose on time. You're thinking, well, hang on, that doesn't correlate. You know, you've only got 12 laps left. Why are you putting in 16 laps worth of fuel? That might have pointed towards them using fuel as ballast in the middle of a race. No, there wasn't any suggestion of that. There wasn't any suggestion that uh, the, the, the suspicions hadn't been alerted in that, in that way. So, um, yeah, if, if they were running under underweight in the race, um, it, it, wouldn't, it couldn't have been by... Um, an outrageous amount, something that would have been evident on the, um, the the timings of the pit stop. Now, despite BAR's confidence, the court wasn't impressed. It declared that the only way Button's car could meet the minimum weight of 600 kilograms was to have used fuel as ballast, which does not conform to the regulations. It also dismissed that fuel consumption data from the team that was intended to prove that at no point did Button's car run under weight during the race, saying that cannot guarantee that the vehicle complied at all times with the regulations during the race. The only reprieve BAR got was that the court did not agree with the FIA's belief that this was deliberate fraud. The court's findings said BAR's actions and the fact that they did not use their right to request a clarification on the rules from the FIA show at the least a highly regrettable negligence and lack of transparency. That's the word Ted mentioned just now. For that, BAR was disqualified from Imola and banned from the next two races in Spain and Monaco. BAR released a statement saying it was appalled by the decision and it said the judgment was contrary to all the evidence heard and the punishment was wholly and grossly disproportionate. Uh, then FIA President Max Mosley briefly mentioned this scandal in his book. He called the BAR trick very ingenious but illegitimate and he said the initial decision by the stewards at Imola to not take action was inexplicable. And as a final fun fact about this story, BAR hired the lawyer that had previously defeated the team in 1999 on behalf of the FIA when the team tried to run two cars in different liveries for its first season. So, Mark, no such joy for that lawyer this time around. What did you think of the exclusion and the, the two race ban BAR received? They had to apply a hard penalty, really. They had to um, send a message out that this... Um, wasn't um, an accepted way of, of running the the race. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, they were they were banned to rights in the fact that the, the car was underweight, whether it had run for significant proportions of the race underweight or not, doesn't really come into it. it was, was it underweight? Yes. So the, the thing was they weren't alone. Um, they, there were several teams operating the same system and at the next race in Barcelona which Ted referenced before where it was confirmed the BAR was banned and it had to therefore pack up and leave so just just really uh, <laughs> heightening the, the the negative attention upon it it was like told to leave and you know, there was a big hole in the in the paddock where the motorhome had been um, and on the Thursday night um, the fuel tank manufacturer, which provided most of the cars on the grid, um, was apparently there up and down the garages changing fuel tanks on a hell of a lot of the cars, um, but not significantly on uh, Williams because um, the Williams had a fully compliant tank. And I was told with much glee by a Williams um, <laughs> employee the following morning, he said, oh, you should have been in this pit lane last night. Lots of fun and games going on, <laughs> pretty much. And, and it was, wasn't was every team, it wasn't every other team, but it was a big proportion of the grid were um, changing their, their fuel tanks as a result of the uh, ruling on the BAR. So that was, um, I'm sure the FIA was aware, had become aware that it was becoming common practice and it, 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 it enabled teams to run fuel as ballast and they wanted to put a stop to it and so when they 
found a car that was underweight at the end, that was the trigger to be able to do it. What did you think of the penalty, Ted? Was it fair what they got in the end? Um, I don't know whether it was fair or not. I mean, it was pretty uh, stark, as Mark says, the way that they waited until everybody had parked up in the Barcelona paddock. And I was um, as, as, as in awe of the uh, BAR truckies' ability to get his, uh, his race transporters out of the paddock with everybody watching um, and with everybody else parked in on that Thursday, um, as I was uh, sympathetic for everybody in Chenson Button and, and poor, poor Taku, who was, I think, car wasn't found to be um, underweight. Taku's car was fine. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're, at, at the time also, we were looking at it in terms of the fight between Max Mosley and the, and the manufacturers as well. It was a perfect opportunity to mess up their zero fuel weight and, and, and not to be able to prove that that uh, uh, sometimes they wouldn't have been able to go underweight. That that zero fuel weight of 594 or whatever it was, had their zero fuel weight BRs always been 600, then they would have been, you know, there would have been none of this. They would have been unable to be to be done like that. And because they were, it was a perfect opportunity to Max Mosley to, to have a go and try and embarrass Honda and the Japanese. But I remember at the time, I'm not sure that worked for them. I think that actually sort of, um, girded Honda's uh, opinion against Mosley and, and, and actually gave them strength and, and conviction that what they were doing was the right way to go. And if Max thought that it was going to weaken the resolve of the manufacturers and Honda especially, I think he was wrong in that. But that was the subtext uh, behind all of that sort of technical um, exclusion that, that BAR had, had, had to serve. Really. Yeah, I think ultimately BAR were arguing, of course, that the car never ran under weight during the race, but that doesn't exclude the fact, as you said there, that the dry weight of the car was under the limit and you're not allowed to use fuel as ballast whether you run under the limit at some point or not. So, yeah, I, I guess, as, as Mark said there, if lots of teams were up to these things as well, it was a good chance for Max to, well, for the FIA to to make a pretty strong point. But let's, let's leave it there for Imola 2005. We'll come back to some of that Spain uh, fallout and, and how and how BAR had to leave once the weekend was already up and running in the future. Thanks as always to Mark and a huge thank you to Ted for your Bring Back V10's debut. And uh, it'd be great to have you on again in a future series. But thanks so much for coming along for, uh, for your first appearance. Yeah, no problem. I'll find out something else that you didn't know that I was largely responsible. Some other complete cock up that I was responsible <laughs> for on the TV. <laughs> that can be, this can be the running feature. It can be your confession corner. <laughs> But uh, we've got just one more of our regular episodes to go in Series 5, and we're heading back to the 1990 Mexican Grand Prix, the race Alain Prost considers the best of his career, even if his Ferrari teammate Nigel Mansell stole some of the limelight with his spectacular pass on Gerhard Berger at the fearsome Peraltada final corner. <laughs> 